Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Wayne's World of Science and Technology. I have a little presentation for you tonight. Takeaways from the Russian assault on Ukraine. What lessons can we learn after nine months of war? Anyway, as you all know, on February the 24th of this year, Russia assaulted Ukraine for the second time. Ukraine has been fighting ever since. Well, actually, they've been fighting since 2014, but only in the uh, east. And uh, from public reporting, both Ukraine and Russia, I've been trying to determine what the hell is going on. Let me just say that it's complicated. There have been several phases of the war. Each phase has had different issues. In other words, I'm going to be damned general here because there's just too much we don't know. For those who want to read a history on the war, a historian I know, Dr. Alexander Clark, check his YouTube channel, has been talking to his counterparts in Ukraine, and they are hoovering up information like crazy, so we might see some early books next year. From a combat report, from combat reporting over the last nine months, I think we can draw some early conclusions. The first is that reconnaissance is a major force multiplier. You know what the enemy is, you can bomb the living daylights in them. Drones are exceptionally important for reconnaissance, especially in expensive drones that can be issued to every soldier. So you can find the enemy and bomb the living daylights at them. I think it's pretty obvious. And we go on to drones are a pain in the ass on the battlefield. Satellite recon is limited by where and when the satellite is, plus the issue of getting the information to the troops who need it. Drones are immediate, making them far more dangerous than satellites. Inexpensive drone killing disabling systems need to be provided to every ground forces corporal and above, preferably with computer aiming. You have to prevent your forces from having the day living daylights bombed out of them. Drones capable of carrying such systems also need to be developed and the aiming systems need to be computerized. Drones suffer from limited payloads. You have to hit first time because you may not be able to carry more than a few uh, rounds. Uh, weapon systems for larger drones could possibly be installed in turrets and on all manned air assets, like, say, helicopters. Missiles are just too expensive to use on a $10,000 drone. A 50 caliber machine gun or a 20 millimeter cannon with an advanced fire control system would have advantages and could also be used to shoot down cruise missiles. If you've seen the video of the uh, Ukrainian boat attack, uh, unmanned boat attack on uh, Sevastopol, you may have noticed that this uh, Russian helicopter is firing on the uh, boat, one boat, and it missed. That's why you need computerized aiming. SAM systems are expensive. Really expensive. The German Flak Panzer uh, Gephardt is a lot cheaper to operate because it's a cannon, it, but it's relatively short range, only 4,000 meters or 13,000 feet. For a small city, it'd be adequate. For Kiev, no. Building a Gepard variant with a larger, longer-range cannon can be really useful for cruise, cruise drone and cruise missile interception. Uh, just for an example, the World War II uh, German Flak 41 88mm anti-aircraft and anti-tank gun cannon had a range of 8,000 meters or 26,000 feet, but that was in World War II configuration. I'm not a cannon expert, so I have no clue what would be the best cannon option for ground-based equipment right now, but I know that our um, propellant technology has improved a lot, and a lot of our other technologies have, and well, yeah, we could probably get a lot more range. Oh, yeah, and again, computerize the hell out of it. Accuracy, you want to hit first time. You want to hit that drone before the operator sees what you're trying to hide. Armored vehicles need AA defenses against drones. Something light. And again, it needs capable computerized aiming system. Probably a 50 cal or something like that would work. Um, air power is of limited use in peer-to-peer -peer conflicts due to uh, SAM systems. And SAM systems are of limited use due to anti-radiation missiles. Can we say catch-22? Any conflict where you can't use air power because of SAMs, you can't use SAMs because of anti-radiation missiles, is going to end up in a cluster F. The best fix for this would be to use remotely piloted combat drones. Uh, drones to be designed to be capable of possibly dogfighting, but definitely long-range um, precision uh, hits with either cannon or uh, missiles. 
Um, and for that matter, there are drones that handle can't that have missiles right now, though they are designed for ground targets. Um, you basically, what you're talking about is it's so a drone that could also be used for close air support with computerized aiming systems, but relatively inexpensive. Um, Bay Raptor is actually working on one, but theirs is going to be uh, relatively expensive. We need cheaper ones. And, uh, well, guess why I think we need more inexpensive AA solutions? Because drones are going to be everywhere. Um, accuracy is king. It doesn't matter how many artillery barrels or rocket tubes you have, you can't hit the broadside of a barn door. Russian artillery is still very much World War I style artillery, in other words, spray and pray. They can deliver a lot of fire, but the accuracy sucks. If it takes 100 shells to destroy something, you have to move 100 shells to the front. Now, that's the advantage of NATO standard equipment. It's designed to a higher accuracy level, and that is even before we get into the Gimlars or the uh, guided barrel artillery shells, which are uh, dead on accurate. The uh, Gimlars are good within, I believe, 3 meters. Had a range of 80 kilometers. That's pretty impressive. Range is also king. If you can't reach the enemy with your artillery, you can't hurt them. If they can hit you, you better pray the recon is crap or you will get pounded. This is where the uh, Gimler's rockets from the M270 Mars and M142 High Mars come into play. The accuracy and range is something that Russia can't fight against because the range allows easy to stay well back from the combat zone where Russia can't find them. Did you see that video of Russia taking out the uh, M142 High Mars on the second floor of a uh, building? Yeah, I just about died laughing when I saw that. Uh, Russian propaganda. It's shittier than their weapons. Oh, which actually aren't that shitty. It's the way they're using them. But anyway, that's beside the point. Um, maintenance is boring as hell. Maintenance saves your ass. Look at the amount of abandoned Russian equipment. Bad tires, broken track links, engines that died, and all that. Everybody equipment that you lose because of maintenance issues is worse than a piece of equipment getting blown away because you did the work for your enemy. Play smart. Do maintenance. Don't be Russian. Communication is also key. Starlink has been a huge help in Ukraine. This indicates that I'm accidentally shipping a few uh, crates of them to places like Iran could help. Or maybe Tigray. Hey, Elon! <laughs> um, larger stockpiles are needed of ammunition. Uh, if you can't figure out why, well... Um, the end of the tank has been announced again. Yay! The end of the tank has been announced every year for the last century. Yawn. Let's face it, tanks are going away. They're just too useful. Yes, the newer weaponry makes them a bit more limited, but they still have a lot of applications. Well, tanks and aircraft are still extremely important on the battlefield. The uh, provision of anti-tank and anti-air limits are used to man portable anti-air and anti-tank limits are used to a certain extent. But the current systems are primitive. Seriously. They need better sensors to pick up targets at greater ranges, and all of them should be fire and forget to protect the operators. Take, for example, the um, uh, missiles that are um, heat-seeking. You pop a couple of flares, and you probably uh, can lose the missile. But what if the missile, when it notices the flares pop, says, Oh, wow! He dropped flares. I'll switch to radar. <laughs> yeah. And don't tell me that BAA Systems and Lockheed Martin and all the other uh, folks uh, can't get their act together and do something better. I know they're going to complain like crazy to me for saying this, but really, what's being supplied to Ukraine and what actually is being supplied to uh, NATO forces is actually 90s year equipment to a large extent. Uh, we, yes, it's been upgraded. Seekers have been upgraded. Electronics have been upgraded. But we really need to look at some new equipment. And that is happening. That is happening. The uh, There's new cruise missiles out which are being used by the uh, U.S. Navy to replace the harpoons. And there's other missiles coming online. But we need more of them. And, so, sorry, I'm getting off track here. Specifically, the man portable ones need to be way, way better. Because, yeah, they're putting a lot of money into the big stuff, but they need to put money into the small stuff. If infantry can carry it with them, it makes a huge difference. 
And I'll add one last thing, which is actually the uh, 17th. Training matters. Oh, does it matter. Without proper training, a soldier is basically a walking corpse. Yeah, I know YouTube won't like me saying it that way, but I don't give a damn. It's true. The Russian mobilizers who was sent to the front without training were murdered by Putin. Yeah, Putin, you murdered every single one of them that's died. And yes, I know that you don't give a damn, but there are a lot of Russian people who do. You better watch your butt. So, the Russian mobilizers who was sent to the front without the training, as I said, were murdered by Putin. The Russian troops are getting sent with three months or less training are nearly the same situation. Because Russia wasted all the combat trainers in Ukraine. Great move, Putin. I mean, good God, they're sending men to Belarus for training. Six months is generally considered the bare minimum of training in most Western militaries, from what I understand. And the training gen then continues in units the soldiers assigned to for as long as the soldiers, both officers and enlisted, remain in the ranks. I'm really going to piss off a lot of Russians, but having watched videos of VDV training, I'm pretty sure that the standard... Uh, Infantry private in the Canadian Army gets more training than the Russian elite airborne forces. Yeah, think about that. Am I right? Damn if I know, but the Russian training videos look awful scripted. They look so fake that, well, $3 bill. I've never served, so I don't really know. I'm just going by looks, and I'd really love to hear from some, if anybody who has served uh, would like to troll YouTube and find some of those videos and drop comments because you know maybe I'm looking at the wrong videos. Maybe I just don't have a clue. But they sure look scripted. And um, the performance of Russian troops in Ukraine pretty well proves that the training is crap. The fact that the Russian Air Force um, apparently his pilots are only getting six to eight hours a year in some cases of flight time? That's criminal. Anyway, that's it for tonight, folks. Hopefully I didn't bore you to death. Have a good evening, stay safe, and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.